YouTube. Welcome to this video series on a 1997 Polaris XLT. We're working on a snowmobile that we purchased two years ago. Last year on its maiden voyage, uh, we unfortunately, three miles into the first ride, uh, broke a piston ring. And that was due to the fact that the machine had been sitting for years and had a cracked carburetor boot that we didn't see, which led to uh, it running very lean with not enough gas and oil in the one of the cylinders and ultimately the engine uh, lost compression and didn't run. So at the end of last season, we rebuilt the snowmobile, bored out the cylinders, replaced everything that we thought were items that were defective, put it back together and took it on its maiden voyage at the beginning of this season. And on our first trip, the snowmobile ran great. The rebuild seemed to be going pretty well, but we noticed there was some hesitation um, in the machine and which we diagnosed as being an issue with the secondary clutch. So last week I rebuilt that clutch and on Sunday took it out for um, a long ride to make sure that we had, had all the issues worked out and unfortunately the engine seized. So the purpose of this video is to tear into the engine and find out exactly what went wrong. Did we do a bad rebuild? Was there something that we missed along the way? Or what I suspect might be the case, is there an issue with the crankshaft bearing, which is a common affliction to these models. So stay tuned as we dig into the snowmobile and the engine and find out exactly what led this to seize and hopefully uh, we'll get it repaired and back on the snow before the end of the season. Next day we are ready to dig into the XLT to see what is going on with the engine. So the first is, so I've got it up on a lift, which you'll see in a second, and I've got the hood um, off to give us good access to the motor. So now let's uh, dig in and take a look at the spark plugs and start the uh, disassembly. Okay, first step one here, so we're going to pull the spark plugs out. Let's see what we got here. So this is the PTO side. And so to me, it looks like we've got a brown wet spark plug. So it doesn't seem to indicate that it was oil starved. So that's the PTO side. Here we have our middle cylinder. Same thing, not sure you can see that well, but that is brown as well, indicating that it was not starved of oil or overheated. And that's the magneto side, and that one as well it looks like a good spark plug. We'll see. Daniel, the next step is to remove the exhaust. So that's what we're going to do in this step. So I've got a handy um, cotter pin puller that someone had left in a car that we had serviced on our 1984 Jeep Grand Wagon here. This thing's invaluably helpful for pulling cotter pins and springs. We just did this a year ago, so it's hard to believe that we're tearing back into this motor again. There we go. Okay, all the springs are removed. Finally. But that looked hard it was. Okay, in this step, we're going to remove the air box. So, um, so this is basically a couple pieces here. So one is we just take the magneto off, which I want to do right now. We've got a couple of these, and depending on your model, these are all in different places. So one of the things I do, since I'm a, uh, I think is, since I'm a novice, I should say, is I tend to, when I take things apart, put the screws back where they came from, or over on my workbench, I've got uh, a bunch of little Ziploc bags, and I 
take things off and label them. There's nothing more frustrating to trying to figure out how things go back together or being almost done with the job and then losing a one final screw. It gets any way to get the job done. So this air box happens to be on with these little clips and which are really cool. If you can see them. I just bought a bunch of those on eBay and they're actually like five dollars a piece. So these are things you don't want to lose. We had an older sled where the air box was screwed on and it kept or screwed together and it kept breaking the, the edges of the air box off. So given that you can't get parts for these anymore, these clips are a much better way to go about things. So I should do it for the clips. Undo the cable here. Side. And then the air box is also held on. The base is held on by two Phillips head screws. Go to switch angles and give you a better look inside the air box. Switch cameras and angles on you so you can see how the base of the air box goes together. One thing that's really important with these machines is to make sure that there's no air leaks because it tends to make them run rich and then um, seize. So um, notice how these rubber grommets are pulled over each of the carbs equally. So all you do to get this off, and I'm going to try to do this one handed, is if you pull it off like that, make sure it's all the carbs. And out comes the airbox. Okay, in this step, we're about to remove the carburetors. I just wanted you to notice that I've got them labeled PTO, center, and magneto. They're all the same, but it also really helps with looking at how all this vent tubing and everything goes on. I like things to be back um, the way they came out of the factory. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna loosen up that throttle body. And the different components. And then the cable just kind of slides in like that. And off that comes. Loosen up the clamp. And off comes the carburetor. There you go. So you want to make sure when you take these off, you keep them upright because there is a, that's full of gas. Now that we've got the carburetors off is to remove the primary clutch. Normally you have to use a clutch holder in here to prevent this from spinning while you do that, but we don't need to because the engine is locked. So we've got a five inch inch socket here on a half inch breaker bar and then we're just going to loosen the primary bolt. important just to make sure you get all the parts out when you take this out. So there is the bolt itself. There are a couple of rubber grommets and there is an insert, an aluminum insert that needs to come out. So you see that's how that all comes together. And then the next step is to pull, so this is pressed onto the crankshaft however, so we need to pull it off there. So what I've got is I've got a clutch puller here that's made for this machine. I've got it soaked with grease. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna thread that on and we're gonna tighten it and what you'll see will happen is that clutch will 
should pop right off. So now I've moved up to a 7 8 socket. And I suppose you could use an impact to do this, which is what they say you should use, but I never had a hard time getting it off. It'd be great if this broke the engine free. Okay. So I'm gonna the breaker bar. Out comes the puller. So we've just pulled our primary clutch, and I thought I would show you um, a new new uh, tool I got from um, order online from Straight Line Performance. And what this is is a a clutch holding tool for the Polaris P85 clutches. And you'll notice that this is bolted to my workbench, and there are some grooves in the holder that line up with the fins on the back of the clutch. So when you go to service these clutches, you slide this, oops, you slide this over and you put the cap on like this. This provides you a very stable base. Um, when you go to service the spider, they're tucked on there, I think at 235 pounds. So you need a real stable base and a big breaker bar to take it apart. Um, and we found this tool to be invaluable. The clutch is off. Next step was to, or is to, remove the coolant from the engine so we can get the so you can avoid spilling coolant all over the place. So the way I do this, there's probably a million ways to do this to siphon this out. I have an old coolant tester. So I'm just basically gonna put this in here, fill it up with liquid, put it in another jug here. Okay, so I decided to kick the whole drain the radiator fluid thing up a notch. And rather than using that um, coolant tester, I figured I'd buy a siphon. So Fresh from Rocky's Ace Hardware. Six dollar Pennzoil siphon. And if all goes well, this will make our life easier. I'm not impressed with the hose. Okay. We have siphon action. These old sleds are not as convenient or reliable as the new ones. But it just, uh, for me, it's been great to be able to work on these with my kids. And uh, it's, I guess it's our version of recycling too. Versus just throwing them in the dump. These were good machines in the day, and this one runs great. So when it runs, so we're gonna get it figured okay, out. So now we're gonna remove the radiator fluid drain. We're gonna remove the connections from the water pump. So this was uh, one, which we have off. Now it's time for this one, and the lock jaws are pretty good for this one. Move that up to the top here. Slide him down. Like so. Make sure we get him loose. Sometimes. 
sometimes you just have to be careful not to damage the hood. You really trust to free it up like that. Okay, so the next step bring in there is remove the thermo sensor. And one of the things that we found along the way was that these like to pop off. And what these do is these will tell you if your engine's hot. And so learned a trick. I found it, it was looking at a picture somewhere that put a put a loop in the thermo sensor wire and then zip tie it. And that will make it stay on. So it doesn't we were constantly finding that these were falling off when we were riding. So that's off. And then next step here is to Remove the upper radiator hose. And again, I think it just might give it a little. That was just off not too long ago, so I just want to bring it up. Okay. We're getting closer. So we're behind the engine now, and what we're going to do is we're going to go and, and remove the line that you can see down there with the green clamp that is the oil line, and that provides uh, oil from the reservoir into the engine. So if we get this apart and find out that the piston seized, I think I'm gonna think that this is gonna be the culprit. So this is, there's a, you can't see it now, I'll show you when we get the engine out, but there's an arm in there which times the oil pump, that increases the oil flow based on the engine RPMs. And if that's not timed correctly, um, it could be lead to an issue where there's not enough oil going into the motor. The engine so. out, we need to remove the uh, the starter, the recoil. Here's a pro tip. Take a pair of vice grips, like so, and put them on the line down by the engine to prevent the line from going into the recoil if it happens to slip out of your hands. The first time we did this, my son accidentally let go of the recoil, and while it was recoverable, it provided him with an opportunity to learn about a bunch of adult swear words. That I would rather not done. So what I'm going to do is pull the knot here out of the handle, and see if I can get this knot out there. If I can't, I think we'll just end up cutting the line, which is effectively what I'm going to do. So I'm going to cut off this knot, maybe. I'm going to be careful with my hand down here just as an extra preventative measure. I've got my vice grip holding on to the line just in case. I'm going to put a big old figure eight sailing knot in that to once again prevent it from going into the engine. And that way, everybody is going to scope us so and happy. Continuing on, we're going to remove our fuel pump and take that off the recoil housing. So, to do that, there's a screw on the top and a screw on the bottom. So, we're just going to Unscrew those. Take the bottom. the top. Okay. Fuel pump's now disconnected from the motor. We've got to remove the, the recoil housing to get to the, the water pump and everything else that we need. This place is 12 millimeters. If I'm correct. What's interesting about this vintage Polaris is that the engines are made by Fuji, so they're metric. 
and the everything else is uh, standard. Okay, so the last step to remove the motor is to remove the engine mounts. So there's two bolts on the back and then there's these um, that just basically mount onto studs. And then in the front there are, there's a mount here and a mount on the other side. So these are 17 millimeter on the underneath. And one thing you have to do is turn the skis to make sure you get your wrench to fit in there. And then there are 16 millimeters on the top. It's good to have a everyone we're at the end of the first segment in this, this series as you can see we've got the engine out of the snowmobile I'm on the workbench here so it's positioned for us to tear it down and find out exactly why it seized so hope you enjoyed the video if so please like I'd love to have you subscribe to the channel we look forward to seeing you on the next video